listening in. Today, we have two amazing guests. I know I always say we have two great guests, but today I think they're two amazing guests uh, with some of the things that they've done. I mean, where else are you going to find uh, a show that has, has a guy who's a best-selling Wall Street Journal uh, author and just finished up a stint as the Houston Texans president? Uh, and then we're going to bring on, uh, and that's Jamie Roots, and then we're going to bring on our, our second guest, Jeannie Achille. And she's not only a CEO of the Devon Group, but she's also running uh, an HR tech summit, and she is the chair of Women, Women in HR. So some really dynamic and awesome people, and that is what this show is all about. And I set out many years ago to have uh, important conversations so I could grow as a leader, so I could get better at leading my people and running my businesses by asking people who I thought were successful, who were doing it right, what were they doing? What were their secrets? What, what were they thinking about? What were they worried about? What were they reading? And somehow that turned into this radio show. So instead of me doing that at a conference or calling them on the phone, I said, let's put it on live. Let's talk about it. Let's let everyone else listen in. And we've had so many amazing stories that have come out of that. In fact, a lot of those stories went into my first book, The Power of Company Culture. You can grab that wherever you buy your books. And you know, over the last year or so, the conversation has been overwhelmingly been COVID, right? And the dramatic shift to remote work. And of course, my organization has been fully remote since 2009. So you guessed it, my next book is called Remote Work. And if you'd like to check out more, there's a huge pre-order promotion going on right now. You can go to chrisdyer.com slash remote work promo to learn more. Now, Talent Talk is live every Tuesday, 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. If you'd like to tune in live, that's great. But if you don't, no big deal. If you listen when you're in the car or maybe uh, while you're on the treadmill, uh, listen to a podcast, don't, don't forget to subscribe wherever you find your podcast on iTunes, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, Spotify. Let the, uh, let the bots do the work for you. Subscribe and they'll always let you know when there's a new episode. So, uh, And finally, before we bring Jamie in here, it's going to be our kind of kick us off for the first half of the show. Don't forget you can follow us on Twitter at PeopleG2. And we, we live tweet with the hashtag talent talk, the show. So anything, you know, incredibly intelligent that we say uh, or anything that maybe you would wish you had written down, a link to a bio, a book, we put that out there so you can go and grab that easily uh, and follow along or even ask us a question, give us a comment, suggest a guest. That's where we're tracking all of that. So Let's go ahead and bring in my first guest with no further ado. Uh, Jamie, welcome to the show. Hey, Chris, great to be with you. I've been looking forward to this one. I've always believed uh, business is about the people, and certainly you feel the same way. Yeah, absolutely. So I know you just kind of finished up uh, your, your latest gig. So why don't you tell everyone a little bit about you, what's important for us to know about you, and you know, uh, besides maybe uh, catching up on some golf or something, what are you doing now uh, six days out of it? Yeah, so uh, yeah, six days ago, I, I uh, was my, my finish with the Houston Texans. I was there for 20 years. The majority of that time, I was the president of the team. I was one of the first employees, started the business side, and, and led that for 20 years. I'm now a, uh, an author, uh, released a book in November called The Winning Game Plan, which uh, you know, lays out my leadership philosophy, and uh, serving as a professor at the University of Houston, teaching, uh, teaching leadership. Prior to uh, the Texans, I started the Columbus crew in Major League Soccer and spent five years there. So uh, it's been a 25-year sports career. Not done yet, but taking a little break. Well, uh, you probably very well deserved. And I imagine, you know, over those 20 years, even just with the Texans, I mean, probably a lot of highs and lows, ups and downs and, you know, challenges. But certainly the last year probably has been the biggest challenge, I think, in the sports world. I mean, there has been, uh, you had nobody in the stands, right? How do you have a season? How do you play? Then we had all the continued issues with social unrest and, and the Black Lives Matter movement. I mean, there were so many different moving parts and things that I think were getting thrown into sports in general. How did, how did you really, how do you view the last year? Was it hard? Was it a, a challenge? Was it, you know, maybe... Uh, you, you maybe you enjoyed every moment of it, right? Just rising to the challenge. What did that look like for you? Well, it was difficult, but it was incredibly rewarding because once again, our uh, organization uh, showed what we're made of. You know, John Wooden, I guess last night with the NCAA championship, this quote is particularly germane, but he said, uh, adversity doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't build character, it reveals it. 
and and the character of our people really shine shining through, particularly the leadership team. And we went from a, a, a projected projection to have another record year to having to completely rework our priorities because it became about our people and about the relationships we had in the community, making sure we were preparing our team, preparing for our season, serving our community well. Um, normally, you know, at least one of those is around revenue generation, but it was really protecting the machine, protecting the people, protecting the team, protecting our relationships, uh, business relationships, and protecting our community. So I think one of the interesting things when I sort of heard you describe, you know, what you have been doing or, or are doing, is you really have a, a unique, I guess, perspective and a unique experience around the young leaders of today, right? You have college students that you're around and you have uh, young men who you're around, young men and women who are in probably all different positions inside the organization. But if we look at the athletes, uh, young men on the team. Um, so uh, do, you, do, you, do you find hope in, in, the, in the, the future for leadership and, and the young people coming up? Because I think a lot of times I hear people complain about the next generation of young people. And it's the same like story over and over again, right? Um, and yet, well, Chris, they complained about my generation. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Right. Because it's different. It's different than, you know, it can, society continues to evolve. You know, there'll be, it won't be the same, but, uh, but I do believe, um, you know, the, the human spirit prevails, leadership matters and people matter and culture matters and purpose. I think purpose more so than ever. I think people don't want to just wake up in the morning, put their time in and, and get a paycheck. They want right. some purpose beyond profit. In fact, they don't care about your profit. They want to go out and make a difference for society, whether that's, you know, the Texans, as we talk about uh, winning championships, creating memorable experiences and doing great things for Houston. They want to make sure where they work is when they tell somebody at a cocktail party that they can have a sense of pride, that it's not just a soulless business, but it's actually focused on serving society in an exceptional way. Yeah, and, and I think you have you've got a pretty good uh, an acronym. Maybe you can explain it to everyone what the praise acronym means that you used to sort of summarize that key talent which leaders must possess. You know, I was about ten or twelve or fifteen years into studying leadership. You know, trying to develop myself as a leader, and I started to see this convergence. And uh, in, I, I, I often use acronyms to help me to drive things into my subconscious. So subconscious. So. Praise is really, I think, this, the, the, the skills that, that leaders need to be exceptional at. P is about the people, you know, being able to work well with, with people, being very good at identifying talent and the right talent to get accomplished, that want to get accomplished. R is about resilience. Everybody's looking to the leader. When we see a setback, how's the leader feeling about it? And you have to be very resilient. You're the first one to get back at it. A is about authenticity. I think if you don't legitimately have a passion for what you're doing, you can't expect that anyone else will. I is about inspiring. Everything you do, what you do, what you say, what you write, has the ability to lift people, inspire them to do more than they thought was possible. S is about seeing around corners, being the person, the one person that, that, that can look over the horizon and identify opportunities and bring it back to the team to exploit those. Everybody else is head down doing the job of today. And then E is about execution, creating a system that consistently gets outstanding results. And I've actually test this praise acronym on a number of leaders. And for the most part, everybody comes back saying in terms of a zero to 10 importance in leadership, all of them are tens. Yeah. And I, I want to go, and there's a lot in there. And I think some of those make, they're very easy to understand. We clearly know that those are things that leaders must have. But the one I see that people maybe sort of, I don't say struggle with it or they just don't recognize it right away, but it's that the, the R with the resiliency. Um, I, I have noticed when things get tough in our organization, if I, if I show a moment of fear or, or concern or if I don't stand up and be the you know, knight in shining armor for them, right? Then they, they freak out, right? They freak out. Uh, I, I told the story a few times, but back when we had the recession in 2009, I was being very even keeled. That tends to be my personality anyways, but I was being very calm. And I thought that calming effect was going to be helpful to everyone. They were actually really worried. They thought I wasn't taking this seriously, right? Because I wasn't 
showing a passion and emotion and like rallying the troops or doing something to show them I cared. And I, and I was a good lesson to learn. I thought I was being, you know, calm and this will be okay. And then I'm like, no, you're not showing me in your case, resiliency, right? You're not showing me you have a plan, you have action, you have, you know, something we're going to do about this. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm anything but calm. Right. So, but, <laughs> but not, not in a, in a, uh, you know, wired way, it's a right. action oriented way. Um, you know, I, I like the, I love the phrase from uh, good to great, the book, good to great that mm -hmm. you, uh, you um, face the facts, but never lose the faith. So nice. it's important that you deal with the environment. Like uh, Ray Dalio said in principles, never, confuse what you wish were true with what is really true. And so you've got to face the facts, but as humans, once we understand the landscape, we can define our action plan to protect from that. You know, the, the challenge you run into is when people start, when the fear sets in, and a, a, one of the tools that we use during the NFL lockout, because there was, it was just like the, uh, the uh, economic downturn, there was, so, there was the opportunity for so much fear that it would be paralyzing. What's gonna happen? What's gonna happen to me? Right. And so we made a commitment to be positively focused, to accentuate the positives in the environment that, so that they are realistically balanced with the challenges that we're facing. And the focus is to focus only on the things you can control. And if you can't control it, you just have to put it out of your head. What can you do about it? What, can, what, what is the next logical thing to do is where you have to keep people's head. And that's what the leader does, maintains a positive, optimistic out, outlook, but doesn't avoid the challenges and defining the challenges that you face. Yeah, and I know you have sort of a 4D leadership model around that. Maybe that'd be helpful for, for people to understand. Yeah, well, I, I think it's just a helpful reminder. It's a very simple um, concept, but you, you know, leaders don't just, don't, man, don't just manage down. I mean, to really be exceptional, you do have to manage down well. And that's all about clarity, clarity about who we are, what we're trying to get accomplished so that everybody understands what is expected of them every day at work. But you also have to manage up. And that's about trust. The, the people, everybody's got a boss and the people that are your boss, they have to over time trust that A, you know what you're doing. B, if there are problems, challenges that they will be the first to hear, they'll never be surprised. You can give them good news whenever, right? Then managing out is all in terms of being respected because when you go outside of the organization to represent it, people are judging the, uh, the organization in its entirety based on what they feel about you. And then across, you know, being a great teammate, being somebody that, you know, that isn't just about themselves, they're about helping others get what, what, what they want to get accomplished. And certainly, you know, as humans, the reciprocity is, you know, once you start doing things to help others, others are encouraged to help you get where you want to go. So those are the four dimensions that, that leaders need to operate in. And, you know, I think it's so important that leaders really have to be ready uh, you know, and working and, and getting better for, for what's to come. And, and even though this last year has been a challenge, I think because it was un an unknown, we, it was for, for all of us just sort of this new territory, right? Um, but I think what's coming next is not new, but it's going to be just as hard. And what, what, what I mean by that is that we have lost good talent during this. And then when, as we bring people back, I think we're going to lose more talent or there's just going to be a, this big jumbling of people going to new jobs and new places, uh, either because they want to be in an office or they want to keep remote work, or maybe they realize now they don't want to do that job anymore. And they want to, you know, they've spent the last year learning a new skill. I, I, I'm kind of foreseeing this talent movement a bit. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so leaders are really going to have to be really know what they're doing, really have their messages down to, to deal with the talent management movement, uh, you know, in kind of changing there. I, I think you have an approach uh, that you've implemented. I think you call it the, the Pez dispenser approach. So uh, what, what is it, what, what, what should leaders be thinking about as maybe they, if I end up being correct, as we prepare for this, geez, I'm going to need to get a lot of talent in the door and, and get them going, where we're, you know, wherever we were before or better. Yeah, well, I, I would say first and foremost, as it relates to the challenge 
Uh, and, and you're right, I've heard that same thing about a lot of transition and talent as a result of what we've experienced over the last year. But it's important to, to embrace, I mean, every, the, I think mentality is so important that life is challenged. There's a book by uh, M. Scott Peck called The Road Less Traveled. In the first paragraph, he says, yeah, life is hard. Once you accept that life is hard, the fact that it's hard doesn't matter anymore. You can just go about your business of solving the challenges that are in front of you. So it's like, I always look at it as like a game. You know, at work, it's a game. We're trying to get results. And, uh, and, and there's always going to be obstacles and challenges. But in terms of the Pez dispenser approach, you know, for me, I just think hiring from the outside has such risk. You do have to do it sometimes, but wouldn't it be great if the, you know, the uh, critical mass of your organization was homegrown? And so we, we created a platform a number of years ago called the Draft Class. And we, we, we hire new graduates that are fired up to work within our organization, and they spend nine months with us. And we tell them very clearly what the expectations are here. Just three things. And they're talents that are available to everyone. You got to have a great work ethic. You have to have a winning attitude, be positive, optimistic, team oriented. Number three is you have to demonstrate a commitment to operate in a manner consistent with our culture, the values of our organization. So uh, to have a respect for that and to really buy into it. And so if those three things are at a high level, you likely have a shot to get a full-time job. And then there are other people that they demonstrate that they're not, that's not who they are, and they can go and do something else. And if somebody demonstrates that this is who they are, we try to find that and we can't find them a full-time job with us. We'll put them somewhere else and keep them on the radar. And when an opportunity comes up, we'll bring them back. I call them our boomerangs. So we have 30% of our business operations team that came through that draft class and was grown through the organization. I mean, and that's really a key way to build culture and to eliminate the hiring risk that exists. When you bring somebody from the outside, you know, sight unseen, or, or you've interviewed them, but you don't really have that great idea. You know, you have an okay idea. And it, particularly if they come from out of town, you have all these wild cards that you're dealing with as to whether it'll work or not. If somebody started from the beginning, demonstrated a commitment, they're probably going to stick for a good long while, and you can grow them throughout the organization. Yeah, and I think what you're really getting into, I, if I kind of reflect back to some some things that I've read, I mean, like the whole stoicism thing, like Marcus Aurelius and all that, we, we, life is not good or bad. It just is, right? right. It's not fair or unfair. You know? It just is what it is. And it's the same thing in business. Business is what it is, and it's not like you're having an unlucky streak or things are just tough for you. You just have to deal with what is coming, be as yeah. prepared as you can, do all that you can to, to come out on top and to be successful. And sometimes you win and sometimes you don't, right? I mean, uh, sports is a fantastic example of that. We've seen uh, you know, countless teams that had the perfect people in every position and the perfect coaches and the perfect you know, uh, uh, management and all this stuff. And they didn't win. In fact, there's been examples with, they did not just win. I mean, they were terrible. Um, you know, I, being a Lakers fan, it was that year we had Carl Malone and Gary Payton and all these people on the Lakers and we couldn't win the championship, right? We had all the like nine all-stars on one team and we couldn't pull it off. Well, there's sometimes when you have too much talent, you know, yeah. uh, they, you know, it has to be the right combination of talent and the right types of talent. You know, I'm reading a book called The Real Madrid Way. And they talk about, you know, there can only be one first among equals, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and when they get that, it's really magic. You've got stars and you have role players and they mix together in the right combination. You can get great results. Yeah. And, and I think about, uh, you know, the last 10 or 12 championships in any sport you want to pick is probably was like one or two really key role players. They weren't the giant stars, right? Right. Right. Um, you know, back and, in the day and, and, and the locker room, you know, the chemistry within the locker room, right. the fact that you've got a family environment and everybody's willing to, you know, uh, su suppress their own needs for the good of the mm -hmm. team. Yeah. And, and I often talk a lot about that in our uh, people ask, how do you hire someone to be a good remote employee? How do you hire someone that can do all of this? And I'm like, they had to be willing to come in and want to be on a team and have teamwork and like, They'll show up to a meeting to help someone else just to help. 
right? Mm -hmm. They'll do that. Not because it gets them anywhere, not because they get a promotion, not because they get more money, but like, because they generally just want to help somebody. Right. And, and they know it might come back to them, of course, but you need those kind of people and that you're right. It's the same thing in the locker room. You need that kind of leadership. You need that kind of uh, a commitment. And, you know, I think the, the yeah, to the team. I think the, the first person that I ever knew as a kid watching sports that comes to mind was like Kurt Rambis. I mean, mm -hmm. that guy, that guy got like 900 rebounds. We played incredible defense, probably scored two points. Right. And, or Dennis and the, Rodman. Or, and then, and then Dennis Rodman was a little bit more noticeable. <laughs> uh, yeah. And I think he, he, he gave fear to that, but yeah, I mean, he was still a role player, right? I mean, yeah. he, but he did all the dirty work. Did all the, and then some, right. I mean, <laughs> Well, uh, you, you've given us so much kind of great information here. You know, I, I'm, I'm wondering if there's a, a, a book that uh, you said you were, you were uh, reading the Real Madrid book. Is, is that the one that's on your desk right now? Or is there any other books that you're kind of thinking about? Oh, there, there's a bunch of books on my desk. There's that one, but I'm also reading, you know, I've just left the, the Texans. I, I know I'll wind up somewhere uh, here and it won't be a startup likely. So I'm reading the book, You're in Charge, Now What? by Thomas Neff. And uh, so that when I, when I do make that move, I've got a clear idea of the first 90, 100 days, how I get off to a great start. Yeah, well, that's a, that's a great book. So you've, you've mentioned several good ones and uh, hopefully people can uh, check out your book. Uh, how, where do they find your book? The Winning Game Plan. It's available at Amazon. And as you mentioned, it's a bestseller. Folks can also uh, go to jamieroots.com or uh, follow me on LinkedIn and uh, lots of great information there. Just, I mean, I see it as a gift to the world. I just want, want to help people be the best, their best selves. And, you know, I, I guess now that you've left the Texans, uh, how would you maybe describe that culture? What is it that maybe you left behind that maybe you'll miss and, you know, or you might want to take into your next role? Yeah, so culture is about values, shared values of a group, but you can't see values, right? They, people normally put them on the wall. We took values and turned them into habits. That mm -hmm. you can see habits. And so I describe it as impact. We want people who are innovative, memorable, passionate, accountable, courageous, and team players. We have a reward system that is very regular to reinforce that with stories of what people done, have done around impact. And we have, in terms of employee reviews, impact is talked about. You know, what are you doing to be innovative, memorable, passionate, accountable, courageous team players? Is that, is that exactly the right culture? No, but everybody has embraced it. They're really, I mean, they're great virtues. I mean, they, they're, they are, they're important to any organization. But the fact that everybody understands what is expected of them is what matters most. And when you build that strong culture, that's how you attract the best employees. You don't have to sell the organization you know, you're, uh, who, uh, what you do screams so loudly, I can't hear what you're saying. And so um, it's all about how you operate and conduct yourself. Well, how can people find out more about you, get a hold of you? I think you mentioned your website. Um, yeah. Is there any other ways that they should think about uh, following you or, or keep it up? Oh, the, the website and LinkedIn and just encourage people to read the book. It's a quick read. It's an inspiring read. That's what I've heard over and over. And uh, it's been rated highly. It's, uh, I, I, think, I think people will appreciate it. Well, thank you so much for being on our show today. Hopefully we can have you come back, especially if you, you know, with your next gig or something, kind of get caught up with you on what you're doing. Uh, but I learned a lot. And uh, again, really appreciate you being on the show today. Thanks, Chris. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. All right, we'll be right back after this quick commercial break and we'll bring in my sec second guest, Jeannie Akili. <laughs> Imagine buying a newspaper and discovering that the news you're reading is six months old. There isn't much that stays the same for six months. And the same thing goes for background checks. In a time when so much outdated information is being passed around, it's good to know that PeopleG2 offers something different. At PeopleG2, we provide today's intelligence, not yesterday's news. Our value-added approach offers you a fully FCRA-compliant solution that includes up-to-the-minute information. By combining industry-leading technology with old-school human investigation, PeopleG2 is able to give you information that is accurate right now, delivered quickly to our online system or integrated with your HR system. So ask yourself, are you comfortable working with old news or are you ready for a different kind of background check company? Visit PeopleG2.com or call 800-630-2880. That's 800-630-2880 or PeopleG2.com. 
Welcome back to Talent Talk Radio Show. In case you missed our first guest, former uh, just just left the Texas Rangers. Uh, if you want to check out uh, uh, Jamie's uh, uh, Jamie Roots on Amazon, or if you want to get his uh, podcast again, don't forget to subscribe to TalentTalkRadio.com. You can go on there right now and make sure you never miss an episode. Uh, we'll have all that up. Uh, and of course, continually, we will be posting on uh, Twitter as we go through right now. And you can give us any of your questions and we can throw them in there. So uh, I want to bring in my next guest who this is, I'm going to, I'm going to compliment her, but at the same time, it'll end up complimenting me too. So it sounds bad, but I mean it in the best of way, which is we were both on the same list for people, people hums, most influential thought leaders. Uh, so uh, really, really glad to have her on the show. She's a, a brand and product storyteller, HR tech and ed tech expert and chair of the uh, Women in HR Tech Summit at the annual HR Tech Conference, founder and CEO of the Devon Group. Jeannie, welcome to the show. Hey, it's good to see you, Chris. Uh, how are you doing? <laughs> I'm, I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Trying to it feels like I we I crawled into a cave for COVID and I yeah. went in there and worked for 24 hours a day, 365. So uh, I'm I'm looking forward to getting outside just so I can take a break. <laughs> you know, I am starting to book my first uh, business travel, wow. uh, which is like just you know the things we used to do every week. You know, hop on a plane. Uh, all of that is now feeling very foreign. So it's, uh, you know, it's going to be interesting to get back, back on the saddle again. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I'm going to have my second uh, vaccination here on Friday. And after that, I think I'll send a note out to everyone and say, I'm vaccinated. I'll come and see you now. So, <laughs> so I have to ask, are you Pfizer or Moderna? I'm Pfizer. I'm there Pfizer. you go. I'm Pfizer as well. Yes. Right. Team, team Pfizer. <laughs> team that's Pfizer. Gonna the, that's going to be the, the, the new way we differentiate ourselves. I that's guess, so. right. That's right. <laughs> Good stuff. Well, why don't you tell everyone a little bit about you? What is it you do? What's your work look like? And you know, what, what should people know, I guess, for the purpose of our conversation today? Yeah. So, so two things. Um, I'm the founder and CEO of the Devon Group. Uh, you know, we're celebrating our 27th year in business this month, which uh, is just mind boggling to me because obviously the years add up, but they also go by really, really fast. Uh, we're a tech agency focused on PR and marketing. But over the years, uh, because I, I ran uh, HR product management at Ceridian years ago, uh, we've developed an HR tech specialty. So heavily steeped in that category, I'm also, as you identified, uh, chair of the Women in HR Tech Summit at the annual HR Tech Conference. I was just the chair for our spring event, which was the virtual event. We are physical in, uh, in Las Vegas this September, uh, September 28th through October 1st. So, um, you know, between Devon and the conference, I'm a busy gal. And hopefully we'll see each other maybe in Vegas. Uh, we can <laughs> we can do a high high elbow whatever they do exactly now. exactly. Um, I'll be I'll be speaking there at at Sherm, so that that'll be fun. Now, I I think that's one of the first ones for sure. I'm, I'm I know I'm traveling to right, so uh, it will feel great. I, I did get on a plane for the first time in a year just the other day, and it, the only thing that could get me on a plane would be to go and drink wine. So we went to Napa for oh how, for, that yeah that's for, a good for, reason that's, that's a good, a good reason. reason. <laughs> I was like well, double, double mass and ready to go. So spe speaking of wine, I mean, I rode your wake in Paris. I don't know if you remember that, but yeah. we were both traveling. I think it was December of 2019. Mm -hmm. And I kept seeing you post on Facebook and then I'd post on Facebook. And 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 it was hilarious because you'd go to the Moulin Rouge and I'd go to the Moulin I mean, I, I was showing up wherever you were about yeah. a day or two afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> I think they have a word for that. It's called stalking. Yes. <laughs> okay, I was thinking synchronicity or serendipity, but there's another S word. Yeah, yeah I got it. Yeah. yeah, I know. That was like our last trip. Uh, we yes, were supposed to go exactly. to Pol Poland in uh, for spring break, and then that all got canceled. So yeah. that was the last trip, and I froze my butt off. That was a great, it was a great trip. We went to Bordeaux, it was cold. We went to Paris, but it was very, very cold that time. So, yes, exactly, yeah, exactly. Well, or my, and I'm I'm Southern California boy, so cold to me is 65 degrees. 
Um, so being in Paris is another thing, but yeah, yeah. nobody goes <laughs> to Paris for the weather. <laughs> no, no. So, you know, I was so much changing over the last year. Um, you know, what, what do you think are some of the big, maybe takeaways? What are the things that you think you know, we were going to remember, or we're going to take away from this time, uh, other than maybe some of the ridiculousness, are there, are there, are there lessons, are there, are there good things that maybe we'll, we'll, we'll carry, you know, with us as part of our tool bag from, from this point on? I, it's hard for me to say good or bad. I think the jury is still out on some of that. Sure. I do think we've had some really pervasive trends that we can't ignore. Um, you know, uh, first of all, we've seen a mass exodus of women from the workforce, uh, not only in our service industries, but our knowledge workers. And a lot of that was forced by childcare shutting down, schools going virtual, people having to homeschool, you know, so that's a huge talent drain. Uh, and we need to provide a path back for those individuals to come back into the workforce. And that's going to have to look like new labor models and flex time. Uh, you know, there'll be some coaching involved, uh, coaching services to get people to feel less anxious about being back in a physical workplace. But, uh, you know, you hear that word empathy a lot. I, I think that's something that... Um, Boy, talk about ripping a Band-Aid off. We, we all realized how human we are and how mm -hmm. much we need each other. And we need to understand how to talk to each other, you know, beyond Slack, beyond email, that we have to find a way to be connected. So, um, so yeah, some really interesting stuff is coming out of, of the pandemic. And, uh, and hopefully the lessons learned are sustainable. I, I think there's been some some really important teachable moments throughout this. Yeah, and I'm really hoping that organizations can uh, adapt their their model, right, to how they work to allow that flexibility you talked about. Mm -hmm. um, you know, whether it's hybrid work, whether even if it's you do need to still come in the office, but at least they're going to be flexible about the time of when you work and how you work, because that has the biggest impact on to your point, I think on, on women, mm -hmm. um, on anyone else who maybe does not fit that typical cookie cutter thing. So we could have people that have, could be students, they could be uh, disabled, they could be, I mean, there's all these different categories exactly. of people that, you know, if you just allow a little flexibility, magically, they can, they can be there. And I, I hate, you know, it's like, I hate like telling secrets, but we've been using this for years, right? <laughs> we would hire people, we would hire, um, yeah. uh, you know, moms, we would hi hire spouses of military, mm -hmm. right? Because I didn't care if they, if their spouse got moved to another base, it didn't matter to me. You can keep working because exactly. you're already remote. Exactly. And, and, and it wasn't hard to create that flexibility, but for so many organizations for so long, it's like, well, no, we have to have them all in the same building. We must do it this way. And there can of be no flexibility and we'll just go get somebody else. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and, and yeah, like maybe they got somebody else, but I have found, I, I get like, a players just because I'm willing to be flexible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Absolutely. Because you get a players when you meet them where they are. Mm -hmm. So, you know, an A player has a lot of options. And so if you want to engage that A player, you know, you have to be respectful of what their requirements are. Um, and and I, I'm with you. I hate that old school command and control. You know, we all have to sit in the office. Uh, you know, we can't can't physically leave the office until we see the boss leave. I mean, I've seen crazy stuff over the years, and right. that's so counterproductive and so demoralizing. And um, you know, when people leave you, then that impacts your employer brand significantly. Uh, you know, they're, they're just not, not out there saying good things about you as an employer. So an employer of, of choice is respecting the differences. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, we all talk about, about uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging. Uh, you know, we have to make sure our labor models align with, that, with those values. Yeah, and I think we expect people to just suddenly... I don't know, evolve in some way, right? That they're not going to act that way. <laughs> yeah. I remember when I was in Japan, I was, you know, so the big news at the time when I was there was that they actually implemented laws to stop people from working these ridiculous hours. It was the same thing. Like you don't go home until the boss goes home. Yeah. And then, 
And then the flip side, the boss was like, well, I'm, I have to stay here and work a long time. So they respect me. Right. And, they, and, and so it's like this thing where they, <laughs> they go in on Monday and they yeah. end up working 20 hour days. They sleep in these pods for four hours and then yeah. people are killing themselves and, exactly. and you know, and it's not good for anybody. Right. Yeah. So, then, yeah. And so we yeah. expected them to just realize that this is a bad idea and change, but it took an outside force. So the government had to say, no, like you cannot do this anymore right. to try to right. force some bit of change. For me, COVID was this forced change, right? Mm-hmm. We, you have to try remote workout. You have yeah. to. You yeah. have to try flexible work. You want to keep your people. Right. You want to you want to keep a, a parent who's trying to homeschool their kids at the same time. You better be flexible about when they work. Or exactly. You're gonna lose them, right? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, like, don't be put off that they're sending out emails to the team at ten o'clock at night. You right. know, they had to work a split shift today, making sure that they homeschooled and met that obligation. And now they're working hard for the company. You know, they're they're devoted employees. But you have to respect that they have other demands on their time. I do remember what you're talking about in Japan. It it is scary that as human beings, we have to be told to take care of ourselves. I mean, we take care of our cars. You know, you go have the oil change, you get a car wash. I mean, we don't take care of ourselves. Um, And, you know, people just run the, the meter not realizing that, you know, there will be consequences at some point. So it is important to have a caring workplace and, and one that, that rewards that balance as opposed to, you know, um, uh, is more punitive when people are seeking balance. Yeah. And, and I hope it will stick. I hope that they'll realize. Yeah. And, and again, it's another one of those like first where people really had deep time to spend with their family. Yes. Um, <laughs> you know, I, it was, I heard, I heard, on, I was watching house hunters uh, international. So she said, you know, every year we used to go to France for six weeks with my family. And I went, who does that anymore? Yeah, right. <laughs> who could go somewhere for which yeah, they should. Right. Yeah. Yes. Here, yeah. Here, we just spent a year yeah. together with everyone that we live with all crammed in a house. And there was some good things that came out of that. Right. We yes. slowed down, we had to connect, we had to do things and, you know, not take certain things for granted. And I think that maybe built up your close relationships in a better way. I hope we take that with us and I hope we take yeah. flexible work with us. Um, I, I'd like to still get on a plane. Uh, yeah. And go travel. I'd still like to go to France. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> so, you know, what are some of the things uh, you're kind of talking to people about, especially around like maybe training and development? Um, I, I think you read somewhere you were kind of using that as a form of, of recognition. Can you kind of explain some of that? Yeah, you know, I, I mean, <laughs> for, for as, as you'll recall, you know, we beat the millennial topic to death there for a while. And I think to the point where everybody was just so tired of hearing about multiple generations in the workplace that we just stopped talking about it. But the reality is that the workplace is still the, the, the central, you know, kind of touch point for training and development. And we do have expectations from our newer entrants into the workforce where they are expecting employers to help them develop skills. And, you know, with skills becoming the new currency, because it's less important that you have, you know, I don't know, Harvard on your resume or some some sort of credential, you know, now we're in a much more nimble environment and having the skills is so important. So training and development have become almost a form of recognition, you know, to be sent for training classes or to be sent for a certain, um, you know, uh, certification. And, um, and I think employers are realizing that. We haven't really heard learning elevated to that point probably in a decade or so, but, um, but we're seeing the resurgence of it. And, and it's definitely tied to that newer entrant into the workplace that has that expectation that the employer is going to provide that. Well, when we got our first PPP money, it was like, you know, we're slower. We know we've got money to, to sustain mm-hmm. us. So that was the first thing we went back to and said, hey, is there, is there something you wish you had done that you exactly. had learned? A course you could have taken a sort of, and we had a lot of people go get certifications and do, because they had the time. Exactly. You know, exactly. and, and I, I do notice that we were, not all, our employees were putting in 
time to things to develop themselves. But I was also noticing that our clients and our partners and vendors were far more willing to have conversations that they had more time. That's really elevated everyone's whether relationship or business. I don't know how to, like, how do we keep that? Right. It feels like we're all running yeah. on a hamster wheel and we, the hamster wheel broke. <laughs> and, and we were suddenly having great conversations and really connected with our family. And it's like, everyone's like, I want to go back to normal. And I go, I don't know if I want to go back to normal. I want to be yeah. free to do what I want, but I don't want to go back to normal either. You know, you know I, I don't know, Chris, I, I, like me, you've probably identified that there was like a lot of busy stuff that we were always rushing to do. So, you know, going back to the the example of business travel, when you think about, you know, how much of our business travel was really, really necessary. Uh, I mean, you know, it's great to see people in person. It's great to have meetings in person. But a lot of us were just on that hamster wheel where we were on the road constantly. So by the weekend, we were totally burned out and trying to make up for everything that we didn't get to do during the week. And, you know, our families suffered, we suffered. Suddenly, COVID puts us in an entirely new situation. And we're like, whoa, wait a minute. What was I rushing to do all this stuff for? Mm -hmm. Like, this is stuff I can deprioritize. And here's the other stuff I can prioritize that is not only adds more value to my life, but it's more gratifying. It's much more gratifying to have an actual conversation with somebody. And, and you know, like, like when you think about um, even as much as I love social media, I mean, we were all caught up, like who's doing what, who's saying what, who's going where, you know, that stuff is great. It serves a purpose, but I think we've been reminded through COVID that there are some other things we really get more value from. So I think the conversations have been very impactful, actually. Mm -hmm. I hope we are able to retain that and that people do respect, you know, that, that kind of high touch uh, interaction. Um, uh, I know we're also... We're also at the point, though, in terms of digital transformation, where we have this human versus machines scenario unfolding. So it's it's interesting, the confluence of all the things that are happening in the workplace. Well, I think the big promise, if we look at it from the term of AI, is that it should be able to take all of that busy work and junk away from mm -hmm. us and allow and then hopefully as things get better, Right. We will do more Zoom. We'll do more things. We don't have to be on a plane. I don't mind getting on a plane to go do a speech, but I know people that were on planes, multiple planes a day, Yes, you know, to, to go see clients or to go to different offices because they had to check exactly. in with employees. employee. Right. Like, Can't you just get on a <laughs> Zoom call and talk to your wife? Exactly. You know, yeah. You know. That's that. That was craziness. I'm, I agree. I think being purposeful makes perfect sense when it comes to travel. I will get on a plane and go to a conference. I will get on a plane and go to, a, you know, um, whether it's a, a customer conference, a user conference, um, some sort of, uh, you know, gathering where there's going to be an opportunity for networking and learning and catching up yeah. with people. I think that's super important. Do I need to go look at facilities and make sure people are sitting at their desks that is a big waste of time and and right. and it's really it really diminishes um uh, your your workplace in terms of engagement in terms of employee experience people don't want to be treated like that so so yeah we need to we need to you know we have a new filter now covid has given us a new filter i hope we don't lose sight of that yeah i, I mean it it, it, there's a certain, I don't know, you almost get addicted to it. There's a certain funness about being on a plane in a new place. And, <laughs> you know, so, suddenly yes. you can you can have a deep dish pizza in Chicago and then you can have a real pizza in New York. Sorry, right. Chicago people. Um, and, uh, you know, and whatever. Best like, pizzas in Jersey. Come on now. Right. You, you right, a shout, shout out for Jersey. I'm sitting right. right here. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you forget about the... Uh, thunderstorm in the Midwest that canceled your flight or the exactly. snowstorm in Denver that cancels your flight and you get stuck somewhere. You know yes. what I mean? And it's not so much fun. So <laughs> yeah. Well, I, you know, I, the, one of the things I wanted to ask you about is I think I heard you say something about uh, payroll being the ultimate employee experience. 
Can, can you explain what that means? I know that's not intuitive. Uh, people are like, what? Why would that be exciting? Um, you know, the reality is we have a lot of buzzy stuff going on right now about employee experience, employee engagement, uh, you know, what actually constitutes an employee experience, what you actually do to engage your employees. At the, at the core of all this is payroll. That is why people come to work. They're earning wages and they expect accuracy, timeliness, options. And we're seeing an evolution in a category that we haven't seen a lot of change in for decades, quite frankly, Chris. I mean, we are now seeing where if I'm an employee, let's say at a restaurant and you know, I get paid every two weeks, but I need to get my wages three days before payday, you know, we're now seeing that level of flexibility in the payroll providers where you can collect your earned wages in advance. So, um, uh, and, and, you know, all of that's in different formats as well, whether it's direct deposit or, you know, uh, on, on some sort of uh, pay card and such. So I think that's actually a very interesting category that we should keep our eye on. Um, but yeah, it's core HR. Uh, you don't expect a lot of excitement in core HR, but I, I do think payroll is a category to watch in the HR tech space. Well, that is really interesting. And, um, you know, you would think that we could develop something like you mentioned, if you clock in and you clock out or, you know, you, you could just get paid every day. Yeah, right? exactly. You could get paid incrementally. I don't know if, how, if that would be a good result or a bad result or how that might change things for people, right? But um, it, it is interesting. We sort of have this bizarre you know, people getting paid every week or every or bi-monthly or mm -hmm. whatever it may be. Uh, and the payroll companies are holding, you know, doing whatever they're doing with the money. There's a whole whole system there. But yes. yeah, yeah, you, you're right. With the, I have seen uh, the pay cards, especially in the restaurant industry, right? Where they're getting their tips right away or they're getting paid mm -hmm. right away. And, and for, for a lot of people working in those jobs, that, that may be key. That may be the difference between being able to, you know, feed their families that day or not. Exactly. Um, you know, or, or a student being able to, to, to go buy t t some top ramen for the night, you know, wherever you are in your life. <laughs> That's true. You know, we've That's all been true. there. So yeah, that yeah. could really change the whole experience. It sounds like it'd be really, you know, for those kind of frontline employees for your, uh, uh, maybe the, uh, early, early entry places, restaurants, things like that, you know, that staffing, you know, anyone who's being mm -hmm. placed by staffing company, we've already started to see some of that growth. So that really is interesting that you could yeah. allow that flexibility, allow some of that to happen. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're raising a very good point because the other thing is I think we, because of what we do for a living, sometimes we lose sight that not everyone is sitting in front of a computer all day long or using technology to transact business. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have a vast portion of our labor force that was particularly hard hit by the pandemic, of course, um, that are in the service industries. And, and so for them, you know, if their car payment is due on a certain date, they don't necessarily have that extra money, you know, on hand. They need that that sooner. And if they've earned it, why not have that level of relationship with your employer where they're able to facilitate that? So, um, you know, some of those throwbacks to getting paid every two weeks or getting paid once a month and some of that, that's that definitely favors the employer. Uh, but, you know, we are now seeing that the employees have a fair amount of say in terms of, of, uh, of how they want to work going forward. And COVID, of course, accelerated that as well. So I know one of the, you mentioned one of the big things coming up for you this year is the HR Tech Conference. Yes. Um, we back in, in Vegas. So maybe you could, what are some of your kind of Early perspectives, what are some of the things you're going to be talking about or, or different things inside of the sessions? What should people be expecting to, to hear from you and others that you're excited about? Yeah, you know, we had um, our first programming meeting yesterday. Uh, we're going to be at Mandalay Bay. So it's a switch. We were at the Venetian previously. We're back to Mandalay Bay, which I understand has been like totally redone. So I'm, I'm kind of looking forward to seeing what that looks like. You know, is it, is it funny that I'm saying like, I can't wait to go back to Vegas because, <laughs> uh, you know, we, we were all in Vegas, like what, six times a year, or eight times a year going to all these, these events. Um, but it's going to be great to be back in Vegas. And you know, we're really going to have a big theme on return to work. 
and what that looks like. I know for my portion of the program, I'm very focused on, you know, people are, are kind of like, I want things to get back to normal um, or, you know, the path back to normal. But one of the things I'm looking at, Chris, is, is the path back to normal really the path forward? Um, because you know we, we've gotten we've gotten wounded here. I mean, we we have to look at we've we've been wounded here with COVID, and um, maybe going back to what was normal isn't really an option anymore. So we have to look at what the path forward is going to be. So we're going to have a big focus on that, and of course we're going to have uh, a lot of wonderful thought leaders, Josh Burson, uh, Jason Averbrook, uh, you know, a number of our thought leaders in the industry will be uh, presenting, as well as a number of the, um, the uh, CHROs, uh, VPs, HR, uh, you know, IT professionals. So it's going to be a great educational experience as well. Well, I know, uh, you know, last year, I think I did over 70 you know, uh, webinars or, or yeah. keynotes and things like that just on remote work. And so far this year, the, the, yeah, that has shifted to hybrid. And so yes. yeah. what was, what was, Hey, teach us how to do remote. Okay. I know how to do that. Let's go do that. And now it's, Hey, how do we have it? You know, how do we deal with hybrid? And so it's really been interesting to see, yeah, I think in years past, it was maybe a little bit fuzzy. What, what, what is, what do businesses or what does HR really care about right now? They have lots of priorities. For me, the priorities have been very crystal clear last mm -hmm. year and this year. Um, and there's maybe three or four really big things. And the big thing that I'm getting hit with right now is hybrid, right? How do we, yes. yeah. how do we handle this, this, this new mode of work? And it's been really exciting to talk about and to do. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm hoping, like I said, fingers crossed, that they're going to keep this flexible work going forward because it's. I think it's so important. I think it's smart. I think it's very smart. I think savvy employers need to do this. It's, It's. you know, like I said, there is no going back to the physical. Yeah. Well, Gene, how can people find out more about you? How can they, you know, figure out where you're going to be, where you're going to be speaking? What's the best way for them <laughs> to do that, to follow you? Well, I hope they'll connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, I, I'm there uh, under my real name, Jean Achille, and also on Twitter. And of course, email is great. It's J-E-A-N-N-E -E at devonpr.com. Yeah. So in case you're going to look her up, it's it sounds like Jean, but it looks like it's J-E-A. <laughs> N N E. So in yes. case you, in case you might go and type in G E N E, like I would, uh, you'll have to spell it correctly to find her, but I'm sure it'll be easy to find her. She's everywhere. Thank you so much for being on the show today. Really appreciate uh, you being here and sharing so much of your incredible knowledge with our audience. And hopefully we can have you come back, uh, you know, sometime later this year or early next year and, and catch up and see what you're doing. Sounds great, Chris. Thanks so much. You have a good rest of your day. All right. Thanks everyone for tuning in. Hopefully you've uh, learned something you can use in your own career in a positive way. Uh, we'll be back next Tuesday live. So until then, do what you love and show the world how talented you can be today.